Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're in Palo Alto, California at one of the Chertoff events. It's called Security in the Boardroom. They have these events uh, all over the country and this is really kind of elevating the security conversation beyond the edge and beyond CISOs to really the boardroom, which is really where the conversation needs to happen. And our next guest, really excited to have, we've got Chad Sweet. He's the co-founder and CEO of the Chertoff Group. Welcome, Chad. Great to be here. And with him also, Reggie Brothers. He's a principal at the Chertoff Group and uh, spent a lot of time in Washington. Again, you can check his LinkedIn and find out his whole uh, history. I won't go through <laughs> it here. But first off, welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. So before we jump in, uh, a little bit of, of what are these events about? Why should people come? Well, basically, they're a forum in which we bring together both practitioners and consumers of security. Uh, often it's around a pragmatic issue that the industry or government's facing. And, and this one, as you just said, uh, priority of security, cybersecurity in particular, in the boardroom, which is obviously what we're reading about every day in the papers uh, with the Petya and not Petya and the WannaCry attacks. These are basically, I think, teachable moments that, that uh, are affecting the whole nation. And so this is a great opportunity for folks to come together in a, in a uh, intimate forum. And we welcome everybody who wants to come. Check out our website at chertoffgroup.com. Okay, great. And the yep. other kind of theme here that we're hearing over and over is the AI theme, right? Yeah. We hear about AI and machine learning all over the place and we're Mountain View, there's self-driving cars driving yeah. all over the place <laughs> and Google tells me, like, you're at home now. I'm like, yeah. oh, that's great. Um, <laughs> but, 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 you know, there's much bigger fish to fry with AI and there's a much higher level. And Reggie, you just came off a panel talking about some much higher level, um, I don't know, issues is the right word, maybe issues is the right mm. word, around AI for security. So I wonder if you can share yeah, sure. some of those I, I think issues, challenges, or the right challenging. Words. That's yeah. probably better word. They're good words because, um, particularly when you're talking about security application, um, whether it's corporate or government, the issue becomes trust. Right? How do you trust that this machine has made the right kind of decision? How do you how do you make it traceable? One of the challenges with the current AI technology is it's mostly based on machine learning. Machine learning tends to be kind of a black box where you know what goes in, and you train what comes out. That doesn't necessarily mean you understand what's going inside the box. Right. So then if you have a situation where you really need to be able to trust this decision this machine's making, how do you trust it? Mm -hmm. What's the traceability? So in the panel, we started discussing that. You know, what, why is it so important to have this level of trust? You brought up autonomous vehicles. Well, of course, you want to make sure that you can trust your vehicle making the right decision if it has to make a decision at an intersection, right? Who's going to say? Right? How do you trust that machine becomes a really big issue. And I think it's something that the machine learning community as we learned in the, in the panel, is really starting to grapple with and face that challenge. So I think that there's good news, but I think it's a question that when we think about what we have to ask when we're adopting these kind of machine learning AI solutions, we have to make sure we do ask that. So it's really interesting, the trust issue, because there's, there's so many layers to it, right? We, we all get on airplanes and fly cross country all the time, mm -hmm. right? And those planes are being flown by machines mm -hmm. for the most part. Um, and at the same time, if you start to unpack some of these crazy algorithms, even if you could open up the black box, Unless you're a data scientist and you have a PhD um, in some of these statistical uh, analysis, could you really understand it anyway? So how, how do you balance it? And we're talking about the boardroom. How, yep. What's the level of discovery? What's the level of knowledge that's appropriate without necessarily being a full-fledged data scientist who are the ones that are actually writing those algorithms? Mm -hmm. So I think that's a challenge, right? Because I think when you look at the types of ways that people are addressing this trust challenge, it is highly technical. Right, people are making hybrid systems where you can do some type of traceability. But that's highly technical for the boardroom. I think what's important is that, the, and one thing we did talk about on, on the panel and even the prior panel which on cybersecurity, governance, we talked about the importance of being able to speak in a language that everyone, that the layperson can understand, right? You can't just speak in a computer science jargon kind of manner. You have right. to be able to speak to the person who's actually making the decision, which means you have to really understand the problem. Because I think in my experience, the people that can speak in the plainest language understand the problem the best. So these problems aren't things that can't be explained. They just tend not to be explained because they're in this very technical domain. But you know, Reggie's being very humble. Uh, he's got you know, a PhD from MIT and worked at uh, the Def Defense Advanced well, he Research the Project. He, he, <laughs> he can open the box. I'm a simple, simple guy from uh, Beaumont, Texas, so I can kind of dumb it down for the average person. I think on the trust issue over time, whether, and you just mentioned some of it, if we use the analogy of a car or or the boardroom, or a war scenario, it's the result. So you get comfortable, you know, the first time I have a Tesla, the first time I let go of the wheel and let it drive itself was a scary experience. But then when you actually see the result 
and, and get to enjoy and experience this, the actual performance of the vehicle, that's when the trust can begin. And I think in a similar vein, in the military context, you know, we're seeing automation start to take hold. Uh, the big issue will be in that moment of ultimate trust, i.e., do you allow a weapon um, actually to have lethal decision-making authority? And we just talked about that on the panel, which is that, you know, the ultimate trust is, uh, it's not really today in the military something that we're prepared to trust yet. Um, I think, you know, we've seen in, there's only a couple places like uh, the DMZ in North Korea where we actually do have a few systems that are, if need, if they actually detect an attack because there's such a short response time, those are the rare exceptions of where lethal authority is at least being uh, considered. I think uh, Elon Musk has talked about how, you know, the threat of AI and how this could, if it's not, we don't have some norms put around it, then that trust could, could not be developed because there wouldn't be this, this checks and balances. So in the boardroom, the last scenario, I think the boards are going to be facing these cyber attacks, and the more that they experience once the attack happens, how the AI is providing some immediate response and mitigation, and hopefully even prevention, that's where the trust will begin. Right. Yeah. The interesting thing, though, is that the sophistication of the attacks is going up dramatically. Right? Yep. You know, why, sure. why do we have machine learning and AI? Because it's fast, right? Sure. It can it react to a ton of data and move at speeds that's that right. we as people can't, as, as your self-driving car. And now we're seeing an, an increase in state-sponsored mm -hmm. um, yeah. uh, threats that are mm -hmm. coming in. It's not just the crazy kid in the basement, uh, you know, hacking away to show his friends, but, you know, now they're trying to get much more significant information. Sure. They're trying to go after much more significant Significant system. So it almost begs then that you have to have the North Korean example when your time windows are shorter, when the assets are more valuable, and when the sophistication of the attacking party goes up. You know, can people can people manage it? You know, I would assume that the the people role you know will continue to get further and further up the stack where the automation takes a much an increasing piece of it. So, so let's pull on that, right? Because so if you talk to the Air Force, because the Air Force does a lot of, a lot of work in autonomy, um, DOD in general does, but the Air Force has this chart where they show that over time, the resources that will be dedicated by a machine, an autonomous machine, will increase and the resources to a human decrease to a certain level, to a certain level. Mm -hmm. And that level is really governed by policy issues um, compliance issues. So there's some level over which, because of policy and compliance, the human will always be in the loop. Mm -hmm. right. You just don't let the machine run totally open loop, but the point is, it has to run at machine speed. So let's go back to your example with the high-speed cyber attacks. You need to have some type of defensive mechanism that can react at machine mm -hmm. speed, which means at some level, humans are out of that part of the loop, but you still have to have the corporate board person, as Chad said, have trust in that machine to operate at this machine speed. Right. Out of the loop. And that, on that human oversight, one of the things that was discussed on the panel is you know, that, interestingly, AI can actually be used in training of humans to up, upgrade their own skills. And so right now in the Department of Defense, it's, you know, they do these exercises on cyber ranges, and there's about a four-month waiting period just to get on the ranges. That's how congested they are. And even if you get on it, if you think about it right now, there's a limited number of human talent, human instructors, that can simulate the adversary and oversee that. And so actually using AI to create a simulated adversary and being able to do it in a gamified environment is something that's increasingly going to be necessary to make it, uh, to keep everyone's skills and to right. do it real time, 24 seven against active threats that are being you know, morphed over time. That's really where we have to get our game up to. So watch for companies like Circadence, which are doing this right now with the Air Force, mm -hmm. Uh, Army, DISA, and also see him applying this, as Reggie said, in the corporate sphere, where a lot of the folks who will tell you today, they're facing this asymmetric threat. They have a lot of tools, but they don't necessarily trust or have the confidence that when the, when the balloon goes up, when the attack is happening, is my team ready? And so being able to use AI to help simulate these attacks with, against their own teams, so they're, they could show the boards, actually, our guys are at this level of testedness and readiness. Yeah, it's interesting how yeah. it's talking to me in the background as, yeah. you're, as you're talking yeah. about yeah. the cyber yeah. threat. Yeah. But, but there's, another, there's another twist on that, right? Which is where machines aren't tired. Um, they didn't have a bad day. Sure. They didn't have a fight with the kids That's in right. the morning. Sure. Um, so, so you've got that kind of human frailty mm -hmm. which machines don't have, mm -hmm. right? That's not part of the algorithm mm -hmm. generally. But it's interesting to me that it usually comes down to it's, as, as most things of any importance, right? It's not really a technical decision. The technical piece is, is actually pretty easy. The hard part is what are the moral 
considerations? What yeah. are the legal considerations? Yeah. What are the governance considerations? And those are what really ultimately drive the decision to go or no go. Absolutely agree. I mean, I think one of the challenges that we face is what is that level of interaction between the machine uh, and the human, um, and how does that evolve over time? Right? You know, people talk about the centaur model, where the mm -hmm. centaur, even the mythical uh, horse and human, where you have the same kind of thing with the machine and the human. Right? Mm -hmm. You want this seamless type of interaction. But what does that really mean? Who does what? Mm -hmm. And what they found is you've got machines that have beaten, obviously, our human chess masters, mm -hmm. and beaten our goal masters. But the thing is, what seems to work best is when there's some level of teaming between the human and the machine. What does that mean? And I think that's going to be a challenge going forward, is how we start understanding what that frontier is, where the human and machine have to have this really seamless interaction. How do we train for that? How do we build for that? So, give your last thoughts before I let you go. The chime is running, they mm -hmm. want you back. Um, <laughs> as you look down the road, just a couple years, I would never say more than a couple years, mm -hmm. and you know, Moore's Law is not slowing down. People argue they're crazy. You know, chips are getting faster, networks are getting faster, mm -hmm. data systems are getting faster, compute's getting faster, we're all carrying around mobile phones and just blowing off tons of digital exhaust as our systems. What do you tell people, you know, how do boards react uh, in this rapidly evolving, you know, on like an exponential curve, um, environment in mm -hmm. which we're living. H how do they not just freeze? Well, if, if you look at it, I think, um, to use a financial analogy, you know, almost every board knows the basic f foundational formula for accounting, which is assets equals liabilities plus equity. I think in the future, because no business today is, is immune from the digital economy. Every business is being disrupted by the digital, digital economy, and it's their businesses are underpinned by the trust of the digital economy. So every board, I think, going forward has to become literate on cybersecurity and artificial intelligence will be part of that board conversation. And they'll need to learn that fundamental formula of risk, which is risk equals threat times vulnerability times consequence. And so in the months ahead, part of what the Chertoff Group will be doing is playing a key role in helping to be an educator of those boards and a facilitator in these important strategic discussions. All right, we'll leave it there. Chad Sweet, Reggie Brothers, thanks for stopping by. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm Jeff Frick, you're watching theCUBE. We're at the Chertop event, it's a security in the boardroom. Think about it, we'll catch you next time.